Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's the way the doorbell sounded at number 14 Pembroke Street in Glasgow, Scotland. That's the way it sounded if a fellow was impatient. If he had just come home from Madeline Smith's house on a March day in 1857 and really wanted in. His name was Pierre-Emile Langelier, and the door was in his way. Why didn't someone answer anyway? Here comes his landlady. She gasped because Pierre was her favorite lodger, and he looked terrible. Awful, standing there in the doorway, swaying. Before he fell on his face. Dead. Tonight, my report to you on Madeline Smith, maid or murderess. Which? Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. Even in the middle 1800s, Kelvin Grove Park was a place to be reckoned with in Glasgow, in the springtime particularly. A bonny place, a place of greens and merry shouts, where gambled the bekilted young people, or the more serious ones where they strolled hand in hand toward some magical and shady and secret glen. In a street which paralleled the park, Pembroke Street, there was a red brick house. It was owned by Mary Perry, a woman of 50, who liked imaginative men, young men of elegance and foreign flavor, like her lodger, Pierre-Emile Langelier. In all my travels the world over, my dear Mademoiselle Perry, I have never seen such a girl. Uh, Once in Algiers, perhaps. But uh, that is another story. Temps perdu, temps perdu. For the last week, you've done nothing but talk about this young lady, Pierre. Where did you see her today? Auprès de la docks, where the pond for them is, throwing to them little pieces of bread, and some, more brave than the rest, would swim close to her, and she would make small noises to them and feed them from her hand. And what else, mademoiselle, you will never guess? Oh, tell me. Her name is Madeleine. Madeleine Smith. Oh, how do you know? This morning, there was a maid servant with her, and they became separated for a moment, and um, I approached the maid servant. With that way you have, I'll wager. <laughs> that thing you, you do with your moustache. Well, yes. Yeah, do it for me. Uh, no, mademoiselle. Ah, please. No, mademoiselle. Oh, oh, s'il vous plaît. Uh, very well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, enough, enough. And from the maid servant, you laid the, le, learned the lady's name. Yes, and what her father's name is and where she lives. Oh. Her father is Monsieur Smith, the architect, a man of wealth and position. I spent the rest of the morning trying to locate his bank. And did you? Certainement. He is very wealthy, which makes Madeleine a beautiful young woman with a wealthy father. Ah, I'm happy for you, Pierre. Oh, but alas, Madeleine is still to me a stranger. But you know so well how to... Uh... No, no, this is a young lady of refinement. I love her very much. If I should do this thing you like me to do and she would laugh at me... I would jump into the duck pond and drown myself forever. Uh, Then how would you meet her? Uh, Will you help me, cher mademoiselle? Will you help me? Greedy, greedy, greedy. Oh, very well. Here's one for you. (laughs) Here now. Here now. Here's some bread. Here you are, you lovelies. Bread for you and you and you. Isn't it a lovely day? 
I, I beg your pardon? I, I said, isn't it a lovely day? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. The ducks seem so, um, frisky today, don't they? Uh, except Abby. See how she sulks there. Here, Abby. Here, here. Oh, sulky duck. Young miss. Yes? You come here every day, don't you? Why, yes. I watch you from my window from across the street. Why, whatever for? Oh, such a young thing and beautiful you are, which is such a joy to an old lady such as I. To an... Uh, What's the matter? Uh, I have a pain. Oh, dear. Where? The nasties. They come on me. I, I think I'll faint. Oh, my. I'll I help you over to the bench. And here, put, put your arm about my waist and... Careful now. Uh, dear ladies, may I be of some assistance? I have here a home medical advisor of the era, the nasties, also known as the vapors, a sudden attack of malaise, predominantly in the female sex, usually preceding a faint. Symptoms, loud noises in the ears, quickening of the heartbeat, and dizziness. Make patient comfortable and apply smelling salts. Now, lie down here on the bench, madame, and we will try to make you comfortable. Uh, ah. Now, if there were smelling salts... I have smelling salts. Oh, how beautiful of you. What? Wait, wait, wait. Quickly, the smelling salts. And that's the way they met. Mary Perry inhaling the smelling salts and the two young folk looking at her, concerned. Then the two young folk looked at each other and became more concerned and trembled a bit. And the symptoms they felt were quickening of the heartbeat, dizziness, and loud noises in the ears. And they did what young folks most always did when they are met in Kelvin Grove Park. Somehow their fingertips met and their hands and they strolled and they found a shady glen. Miss Perry watched them disappear with a happy tear in her eye. She had done her bit for Pierre. Things went so well between the two young people that a couple of weeks later, this was the state of affairs. Your mama and papa asleep. Oh, quickly. Come on in. <coughs> Careful. Careful. <coughs> you... oh, every time you come through this window. Then why do you not put the lamp in another place? Shh. Oh, me, me. oh, my darling. <coughs> Love. Me, 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 me. Oh, we will marry. Oh, wonderful. Oh, me, me. The right way. Then you've talked to your mama and your papa. Yes. And they are happy. They are overjoyed. No. But you said... We can still get married. You have a job, and, and I'll work, and... You? Work? Oh. What's the matter? The thought of you at work, stitching and sewing, or, or, or at the laundry, with these fingers, these precious little fingers. Oh, Pierre... In other words, your mama and your papa... Will disinherit me if I marry you? I refuse to have you disinherited. But then we won't get married? No, somehow, somehow... What? It is more romantic this way. Letters to each other each day. And the clandestine meeting. And the kisses. And the... Oh, <laughs> I know. The hot chocolate. Oh, yes. It should be boiling now. I bring it to you. And that was the romance. My own beloved, you have just left me. Oh, sweet darling, at this moment my heart and soul burns with love for thee, my own sweet one. Oh, what would I not give at this moment to be your fond wife? 
I love you with all my heart and soul, sweet love. To which her lover answered, My dearest, beloved Mimi, since I saw you, I have been wretchedly sad. Think of the consequences if I were never to marry you. What reproaches I should have, Mimi. However, as soon as your papa pledges not to disinherit you, there will be a wedding the likes of which... And the meeting. And the nourishment. Ah, oh, oh, Mimi. The hot chocolate of my Mimi is... Oh, oh Pierre. Oh, my darling. No, oh. listen. Yes? We have been meeting like this for six months oh, now. Six months of paradise and bliss and six... When will we marry? Has your father changed his mind? Today my father introduced me to a young man. Oh, who will quickly fall in love with you and die in despair for your love. Oh, Mimi. Wait. Mimi. Why? His name is William Minnock, and he is handsome and he is rich. And? Oh, Pierre, I do wish we could get married. <laughs> And that's the way it's done, Miss Smith. Manipulation. Borrow from one stock to buy the other, and when the other is going up, then we pay back. You see? And that is how one becomes rich, Mr. Minnock? <laughs> well, is it? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, Miss Smith. Uh, careful, careful, you'll fall. Uh, perhaps you'd just better row, Mr. Minnock. All right. Miss Smith. Yes? William? You said William. Yes, I did. And may I call you... Madeline. 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 Yes? It's two months since I've known you. Yes. Last night I... I spoke to your father. About me? How dear you are to me. How much I love you. And what did my father say to you? That if you'll have me... He would be very happy. Oh, Madeline. Oh, I don't know. I, I just don't know. But you must. These wonderful days together, you've, you've given me hope. Oh, William. Aye. Put the oars down. Now, come here. <gasps> Kiss me, William. Oh, why, why, William. That, that was very nice, William. Very nice indeed. Madeline. Madeline. Oh, Madeline. Madeline. Better and better gets your hot chocolate, chérie. Mm. My sweetheart, my love. There is something mm. I must ask you, Pierre. Yes? My letters. I have saved every one. I want them back. Uh, but why, my pigeon? Well, I, I think sometimes of what I've written to you and such outpourings. But your outpourings are for my eyes alone. Oh, give them back to me. No. But why not? I will tell you why not, little dove. If you look with love at another man, I will take the letters to your father and prove to him that your love for this another man is a passing thing and that your love is only for me, your true love, who you will marry as soon as your father puts aside a suitable dowry for you. I see. Of course you do. You are blackmailing me, Pierre. Oh, love, love, come to me. Kiss me, and kiss me. How cool your lips are, love. A 
Apothecary. I would like five ounces of arsenic. And you know how Pierre liked his hot chocolate. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. This Friday night, Mr. Keen, tracer of lost persons, will be looking for a killer with purple hands. When a wealthy widow is killed, Mr. Keen uncovers the fact, fatal to her killer, that purple hands will reveal who was guilty. Don't miss CBS Radio's Mr. Keen in action this Friday evening over most of these same stations, taking on the case of murder and the killer with purple hands. And now, once again... Thomas Highland, and the second act of Crime Classics, and his report to you on Madeline Smith, Maid or Murderess, Which? A few words about arsenic. Its number on the Mendeleev table is 33. Its atomic weight is 74.93, and it has a valence of 3 and 5. It is of a silvery luster, but be careful about exposing it to the air since it will tarnish readily. It is used widely in glass works, in making pigments, in calico and indigo printing, and for poisoning animals. Some people eat it. In the Balkans in particular, it is possible to brush shoulders with arsenic eaters. Other people, however less innocent, use arsenic to poison people. Still other people use arsenic to poison themselves. I would like to remind you that Madeline Smith, a beauty of Glasgow, Scotland, purchased five ounces of the stuff from McConnert, the apothecary. But then arsenic was also used for the skin as a clarifying agent, it is said. Madeline purchased it, went home, had dinner, chatted with her folks, waited for them to sleep, put some hot chocolate to a boil, returned to her room, waited a bit, and opened the window. Oh, chérie, chérie. Oh, my darling. Oh, vraiment? What? Truly? Why, of course you are my darling. Then what about Monsieur Minor? What endearment did you name him? Guppy? Sweet bun? What? Lovey? Honey pie, ginger snap, what? I have seen you. Spy. Because only I am a man in love. Therefore, I am capable of every ruse. What is spying to a man in love? If you loved me, you'd give me back my letters. Oh, letters, letters. Oh, my darling, give them back to me. If I did, how would I keep my heart warm when you are not near to it? How would oh, I... Be... stop it, stop uh, it. Uh, of course. Now, come to me. No. Pierre. Yes? You are cruel. Cruel and gentle, sane and mad. The prerogatives of a man in love. Yet you would show those letters to my father. To, to your father, to your mother, to the man on the street. Anything to keep you from another. Pierre. Yes, little pigeon. You say that you've seen me with Mr. Minock. How? I was behind the bush in the park, near the glen that we used to know. And? I heard Monsieur Minoc ask over and over that you set a marriage date. I heard also your laughing, but I did not hear your saying no. Father said I might marry him, Pierre. Then tell your papa you do not wish it. Oh, Madeleine. Yes? This morning I read again your letters. Such letters, such warmth, such eagerness, such ardor, such... Uh, oh. <laughs> Is there chocolate, Mimi? Oh, always. I'll fetch it. Oh, little pigeon. Come in, Pierre. You're happy. Oh, oh, oh. Your Madeline was. Um... Oh. And you? 
Me? The most perfect landlady in the whole world. Pierre! Help me. Help me. Oh, what's, the, what's the matter? You have the nasties. You have... The... Miss Perry knelt over Pierre, and she knew right away it wasn't the nasties. His eyes were rolling around, and his mouth was grimacing in wordless pain. She went for the cologne, dabbed a little on herself, came back, dabbed a little bit on her lodger. A little later, she helped him up the stairs. Oh, lean on me, Pierre, lean on me. And helped him to his bed. Miss Perry was never so efficient as when there was a helpless man about. The next morning, Pierre was completely recovered. The next night, he went to visit Madeline in her chambers again, refused to give up the letters again, and had some of that good hot chocolate again, came home to Miss Perry and fell flat on his face again. This time, he was in bed for three days. Which brings us to the evening of March 23rd. As he was walking toward his sweetheart's house, Madeline Smith was attending Mr. Minnach. Oh, come sit by me, William. Hmm? Sit here by me. I, I wish to talk with you. Okay. Oh, dear William, do you love me very much, William? Oh, hi. How much? From, from here to a star, father. Suppose, suppose, William... Hush, that... hush, hush. Oh, but, but you must listen. No, no. You listen to me. If you're about to tell me about that monsieur, uh, about Pierre Langelier, don't. I have heard whispers, but I deny them with a laugh and a shrug and a... What's that? Oh, the, the shutter, perhaps. Nothing. Uh, I'll see what it is. Oh, and William... I love. There's some chocolate on the kitchen table. Uh, put it on the stove over the fire. Of course, love. And, and wait for me down there. Cherie! Quickly, come in. <clears throat> oh, I have missed you, I have missed you, I have missed you. Oh, my darling. Three days I was in bed and my thoughts of you always, dearest Mimi. I know, your thoughts fled oh. to me and caressed me and warmed me. Vraiment? Truly. Oh, was there ever a love such as ours? Never, never. Oh, never. And eventually... What? We will marry. Did you know that? Do you truly think so? Oh, what manner of man would I be? This is tapping upon the window, this stepping over the casement to your arms. Of course we will marry someday. Oh? Of course. For each day, each night that I come here to you and hold you close, I bind you closer to me and there is no escape. No escape. None. Pierre? Yes? Haven't you been feeling well? Uh, I said to you I was in bed for three days. Well, why? From what illness? Of all over. Twice. Oh? Each time I have left you, the last two times, I have gone to my lodging house and I have sickened. Oh? Madeleine, I know just the thing. Oh? Hot chocolate. I'll fetch you some. Oh, guppy. Pierre Emile Langelier, dead. He was buried Thursday, March 26th. And on Monday, the 30th... Look at those letters, sir. I told you she poisoned him. These letters, sir. They, they, they were in his room. I was the dear man's landlady, and I, I demand the police read these letters. The police read them. On Tuesday, they dug Pierre up again shipped him to the laboratories, and the skillful men there found 86 grains of arsenic in his body. That same day, Madeline was arrested, charged with two counts of attempted murder and one count of murder, 
and brought to trial on the 30th of June. Madeline herself did not testify, but Mr. Minoch did. I am a merchant in Glasgow. In the course of the last months, I paid my addresses to Miss Smith, and I have made proposals of marriage to her. She accepted. I knew, of course, that she knew a man named Pierre-Emile Langelier, but I was unaware of an attachment or peculiar intimacy between she and this man. And uh, of the letters this court has read, I... What of the letters, Mr. Minnaugh? I don't know what to say. Yes, I do. I'm shocked. I'm deeply shocked. The trial lasted nine days. To one charge of attempted murder, Madeline Smith was found not guilty. To the other charge of attempted murder, the verdict brought in was not proven. To the charge of murder, the verdict not proven. I uh, want to congratulate you, Madeline, on your acquittal. Oh, now we can be wed. Oh, no. I'm off to India. However, she did get married twice, and she came to America. She lived till she was 90 years old. An amazing thing, her complexion always clear and youthful. She was a frequent sight at the drug counters, a big buyer of arsenic, wherever she was. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Madeline Smith, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed by Bernard Herman and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Betty Harford was heard as Madeline, Florence Walcott as Mary, John Daner as Pierre, and William Johnstone as Minnock. Gil Warren speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, the state of Vermont. In those years from 1812 to 1820, the hills were green and filled with the little people, and it was worth your life to be caught with them. My report to you will be on the Bourne Brothers and the Hangman, a study in nip and tuck. Thank you. Good night. About 58 million of us will have to file our income tax returns to Uncle Sam's Collectors of Internal Revenue by March 15th. Taxpayers entitled to refunds will get them sooner by filing early. Every citizen, regardless of age, with 1953 income of $600 or more, must file a return. Returns should be complete and accurate, signed by taxpayers. Joint returns, signed by both husband and wife. File your federal income tax return early. Assistance is free at any collector's office. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Thank you.